Hi, can everybody hear me? Is that fine? Um, so apologies, it's going to be a bit of a scroll through. So I am the... Oh, I'm like yeah. going for this. Okay. Oh. I hope you can hear me now. Um, so I'm the token banker for this um, session, this conference. Um, so I work for Lions and Global Partners. Um, we are a, an advisory and asset management firm. We primarily work in emerging markets um, on development related um, issues. So a lot of infrastructure, renewable energy, healthcare, um, water and sanitation and climate finance. Um, primarily in Africa, but globally in terms of emerging markets. Blah, blah, blah. So um, I'm here to talk about financing water and sanitation, which is one of the things that I do uh, with my time, um, <laughs> and um, green finance as well. But let's focus on um, water and poop here. So um, this is sort of a disclaimer. Um, and it's really to say that a lot of people think about finance as a panacea. It isn't, right? Um, you can use finance and financial instruments and tools to bridge a gap. Um, or to address a specific problem. You can't use finance to create a market. So I don't know if there was a lot of talk about market-based solutions today, um, but, but this is something that, that, that is quite popular in, in, in sanitation at the moment. And really, finance is a way of enabling markets, but it's not a way of creating markets. Um, and that's something really, really important to, to think about. Um, and so, for example, blended finance is something that um, is, is becoming more popular in the water and sanitation sector. And this is very much an instrument to tackle a problem. And in that case, the problem is um, risk. The private sector deems the returns too low and the risk too high to invest in something. And hence, blended finance can be used. Concessional loans. These allow businesses to operate um, by having access to capital. Um, without bankrupting themselves. Um, subsidies. Subsidies are not evil. Um, these, these, this, again, is a financial instrument um, to make a service available to those who can't afford it. Um, so that's one, one disclaimer. Um, and the, re the next one is really is talking about um, risk and return. So this is key to any conversation, which includes finance. And um, I work a lot with um, governments, uh, parastatals, um, and also private sector companies on working out what kind of finance they need for their business model um, and, and what kind of finance they can support. Um, so correctly understanding the risk involved in a business model or in an initiative and apportioning that risk correctly to the right kind of entity is very, very important. So as I said, the private sector will take a lot of risk if they can get a lot of return. Um, a grant is essentially um, used when there is no expected return, right? So that's it, it, those are the two ends of the spectrum. Um, it's important to remember that theory doesn't always equal like what happens in practice. Um, and so we hear a lot about innovative finance and we get very excited about it and want to apply it to everything because it's going to solve that problem. No, it solves a specific problem and the instrument needs to be suited to the problem that you're trying to solve. So results-based finance, fantastic, only works for governments. You cannot give an NGO that has no balance sheet a promise that you're going to pay for the results 10 years down the line when they can't actually implement that solution today, right? So it's very, very important. Results-based finance is great, but needs to be correctly applied. Um, and the same with development impact bonds, which are kind of taking hold. Sorry, I'm rushing through this because there's quite there's just 10 minutes. Um, so specifically, um, financing water and sanitation. Um, so the way I see the sector at the moment um, is somewhere between there being nothing in place and having something financially sustainable. And a financially sustainable enterprise is usually a profitable enterprise um, and operationally sustainable enterprise. Um, so really what we're trying to do is <laughs> get to four, which is resource efficiency, um, but we're not anywhere near that yet, in, even in developed markets. Um, so talking about sanitation and how do we finance sanitation? So um, 
this is something Barbara Evans um, alluded to earlier, but I always think it's really, really important when we talk about finance, funding sanitation in developing markets that we think back to what happens in developed markets, right? And actually, we forget that a lot of the infrastructure that was put in place that we use every day was funded by the government. This is not a coincidence, right? So when we charge into you know, Malawi or wherever else saying, hey, the private sector needs to do this, actually, we never expected the private sector to do it anywhere else um, and in a lot wealthier countries. So um, we need to really kind of think back to what, what are we asking people to do. Usually privatization has happened, so for example, Thames Water, but this happened after the huge capital expenditure that went into setting up a sewerage system. Thames Water never paid for that. And to this day, our water and sanitation sub, uh, services are subsidized. You and I do not pay for water treatment of, of what comes out of our toilets, to be completely honest. Why? Because even private sector firms get subsidies from the government in the form of tax breaks and concessional loans. So when we say, you know, we expect people to pay and come in private sector entities to turn a profit and not rely on subsidies from the government, actually, that doesn't even work in the UK. So why should it work anywhere else? Um, so that's kind of the background. In developing countries, the, what happens a lot of the time is that there is no budget for, for um, water and sanitation. More so for sanitation because it's actually not a very politically attractive thing. So water is something that politicians like to promise and people, there's relatively strong willingness to pay. But for sanitation, there's a lot less of that. Um, and so there's a lot less public capital um, kind of budgeted for it. Um, in addition, somebody earlier on today pointed out that usually countries are very happy to put um, some money into infrastructure like roads. Roads are productive. Roads allow for trade. Um, so, and sanitation isn't. It's not a productive sector. I actually think it's more of a social sector. Um, so a social, like social and healthcare sectors, it doesn't have an immediate return. You can link it to long-term community-wide health benefits that are monetizable in terms of healthcare costs, but there is no, no way of linking it to income directly. So um, that's very, very important. It means that actually that municipal and public um, budget is very low. So you end up with a very diverse landscape of people who are trying to address water and sanitation in these countries. Um, and so everyone's doing a little bit and there's not very much coordination a lot of the time going on. And across the top of that, we have households because essentially what we're saying is they are the ultimate payer in most of the models that we've come up with, um, which is very important to remember when we think about our own subsidies. Um, and there's a huge lack of capital um, and, and you know, filling that gap is very, very difficult. Um, which brings me to cash flow sanitation, because we always talk about sources of finance and who pays. And actually, one thing that we need to think about is the fact that sanitation is very, very different from, say, a power station. Um, so water and sanitation infrastructure requires a huge upfront investment, which is this, sorry, some of the, the presentation hasn't come through properly. But the green big thing at the side is your capital investment. So that's what you need to construct a water treatment plant or uh, pipes for sewage networks. Um, and then you have the blue, which is, called, is OPEX. So that's the money you need to spend to maintain that service and operate that service. And then you have um, red and yellow, which are two different scenarios of revenues that you might make. So you can very clearly see that no matter how long you keep the chart going, you're never going to be able to pay back that green bit with your red bit. Like, it just won't happen. The margins are just too low, which is why we have subsidies. Um, and so the, the problem with that is that when you start looking at the private sector, actually, that's not a very attractive business proposition for the private sector. So what you really need is a way of changing this, and this is where innovative finance comes in, um, to, to make sure that actually the private sector can come in. And if you think about what I said earlier about Thames Water, they really kind of came in 
after this green bit had already been spent by somebody else. So they can operate very, very well because they never absorb any of that cost. So that's, that, and when we go into other countries, we expect maybe something else to happen, but really, you know, this is, this is what it looks like. And another thing that is important to remember is that actually willingness to pay by the households vary significantly for different services. So any urban area that you go into in most developing countries, you will find that there are people who are emptying pit latrines. Why? Because people are willing to pay to have their pit latrines emptied. But what people are not willing to pay for is the treatment of that sludge. Why? Because it's not in their household. And once it leaves your house, you no longer care because it doesn't smell and it's no longer your problem. Um, so there's like a real, I, I, I strongly believe in water and sanitation as a service, not as a technology, standalone technology. And I know there's a lot of discussion about that going on with reinvented toilet and everything else. And these are great technologies, but we need to think about them in a more holistic sense. So we ourselves do not empty our own toilets, right? But we are expecting other people to do so. Now, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good or you know whatever that saying is but you, we have to be realistic about this and it is a service that we are provided we pay our water bills and we flush our toilet right so it's 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 not just a particular bit of kit on its own and whereas people will be willing to pay for the toilet and for it to be emptied they're not willing to pay for it to be treated so who absorbs that cost is very important just as much as who pays for that infrastructure um, so where does development capital or aid capital fit into all of this? It could do a million things. There are so many things it could do. So the biggest issue, as we said, is um, lack of municipal finance. So funding for that big capex or for any sort of um, subsidies. So could they make, could, they, could it give, give loans to, to municipalities? Which by the way, most of these countries cannot access any kind of credit because they are just completely uncredit worthy. Um, could it give utilities loans to improve their service delivery? Um, and once actually they improve their service, people tend to be willing to pay a little bit more if they can um, for, for better service. Um, could it provide patient working capital? So after you have, for water and sanitation, after you have this big capital expenditure, you also have ongoing costs. Um, can they provide support for that? Infrastructure equity, can they just pay for the capex up front to say, I'll give you money to build this plant. Um, scale equity, there are so many really interesting private sector solutions out there which receive some grant financing from somebody for a pilot. And then they say, well done, this worked really, really well with three households. Now go forth and conquer the world with absolutely no support. What? In, <laughs> so that's a huge gap right there, like somewhere between the pilot and when you've reached scale and you're successful. And then um, targeted business loans for small operators. Um, in reality, some of these things do exist or they should exist. Um, so we have the IDA, IBRD, um, government subsidies, but really there's a big no man's land around um, equity, sort of medium sized equity. Um, which allows companies that maybe have an innovative solution to actually target more than one village. Um, and that's really where the role of private capital might come in. Um, however, at the moment, it's not there. So there's a lovely illustration of the value of that, which everybody might be familiar with. Um, and it's really between, as I said, between pilot and sort of large national scale projects. So the World Bank isn't going to get out of bed for a five million loan or a five million equity investment in container based sanitation. Um, we're starting to see some changes. So, um, for example, in Nairobi, there is a container based sanitation company called Sanergy that's um, looking to sign a PPP, so an agreement with the municipality whereby they're going to get paid, they're going to get a subsidy for each person that uses their toilet um, every year. So um, it's, we are making some progress, but still these companies really struggle and they really rely on um, family offices and foundations um, to sort of get off the ground. Um, 
the problem with just, oh, and yeah, sorry. In kind of everyday terminology, that would be VC and um, growth capital. So um, that's, you know, uh, what, what you hear, hear about in Silicon Valley. But um, people have an expectation that for some reason an impact sector should give you the same returns as normal market investments, and that's just not the case. Hence why there's no private sector capital in here, because the returns just aren't big enough, um, which is what I'm talking about here. Um, the Usually, people don't want to really accept this at the moment, but um, there is a trade-off between impact and returns. If there weren't, we wouldn't be here. Well, I speak for myself, I wouldn't be here, because you know the private sector would be all over this, and private capital would be financing all of these nasty things. Um, and here I've tried to qualitatively sort of highlight where the returns and impact are. Um, because large treatment, nobody wants to do that because there's very little return. So there's companies that produce biogas, there's fuel pellets, there's a wealth of solutions out there of things that you can resale from sludge. None of those have managed to make enough money to sustain the capital investment that you need for sludge treatment. So that's still a very big issue. Um, and this is why there's it, if people, when people expect the private, private sector capital to come in, um, everyone seems to be confused as to why aren't they stepping up, because the returns aren't big enough, right? And we have impact investment, but there's not very much of it, and even they expect some return. So how can you, one of the ways that you can um, sort of bridge that gap is uh, blended finance. Um, what this does is it allows you to lower the risk to the private sector of putting money in something. And it actually reduces the amount of aid capital that you need to leverage, and we like this word leverage now, um, to leverage that private sector capital. So um, this is something we've been working on recently. And granted, it's in water, which is a lot easier to do than sanitation. Um, but it's essentially saying, OK, well, there's a bunch of water utilities in Kenya that do not have enough money to improve and extend their service. And the government budget only covers 40% of what they need. So how are they going to get the rest of the money? And they cannot access capital markets or anyone else um, for a loan because they're actually completely uncredit worthy. They don't have a great track record. Um, so what we're structuring is a pooled debt fund um, whereby there is some aid capital put in to absorb excess risk and then loans to all of these different utilities are bundled together um, um, which decreases the overall risk to any investor putting money in this fund. So this is not innovative finance. This is done in developing market, in developed markets all the time in terms of bundling, like mortgages, for example. We all know how well that went, but still. Um, the, so essentially what we're doing here is saying, okay, let's pick some utilities that can sustain some debt and let's give them access to that so they can improve their service. Um, and it, you know, it, 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 it's worked before, it's worked very well in India. Um, and we're now trying to do this in, in Africa. So um, yeah, that was a very, very, very quick tour of finance in water and sanitation. Thank you.